Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to tell you about some of our work, which deals with chemical compound space, and we use machine learning and alchem computational alchemy um, to explore compound space from first principles. Um, before I jump into things, um, we uh, actually uh, have a new journal. The Institute of Physics in the UK uh, decided that this is a good idea. Um, it was started this year, it's open access, and if you think that you have a machine learning paper which has a, represents a technological advance, a development paper that's relevant to multiple communities or different domains, then please consider this um, journal. There's a, a very uh, good editorial board on it and uh, you, you should find uh, high quality contributions in there. Um, and I should also uh, acknowledge first, uh, before I forget, the people who actually did the work. So, in particular, um, I also circled some past postdocs, uh, uh, whom you might recognize uh, in the audience. Um, and then there was also a lot of the work was done by Bing Wang, who is a postdoc in my lab, Felix Faber, who recently graduated. Uh, he's about to join the lab of Alpha Lee in Cambridge. Um, and Anders Christensen, who is also a postdoc in my lab. Now, um, this uh, workshop is about uh, explainability and interpretation, so I uh, allowed myself to introduce some things I normally don't present in scientific talks, so um, please humor me. Um, Lord Kelvin uh, gave this quote, then, when you cannot measure something, you, you have a meager understanding. Um, and so we certainly all agree, um, I think, that it's good to calculate things. And here's one way, maybe the most important equation in chemistry, Schrodinger's equation, is an eigenvalue equation. And um, uh, a couple of years back, I, I was at a, at a workshop uh, at the Foresight Institute, which is sort of a think tank for nanotechnology. And Sergei was there as well. And, uh, I got into talking with one of the participants, uh, telling him we are, we are using uh, quantum mechanics, and he asked me which interpretation I, I, uh, I, I am a fan of. And so there are all these interpretations, Copenhagen, many worlds, consistent histories, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I, I was a little bit at a loss. I didn't know this. Last time I thought about this was in high school, I, thought, I think. And so, um, Actually, um, uh, I, I, Nicola Masari, who's. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> no, I thought about the philosophies of quantum <laughs> mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Nicola Masari was also a participant, and he's, he's the, the Superman, and you know this, he, the Marvel comics, so. His uh, compute center in Switzerland is called Marvel. So uh, here he is. Uh, he was also attending, and I asked him, what, what do we do? <laughs> and, and <laughs> which interpretation do we have? And so apparently, it's the shut up and calculate interpretation. Um, and uh, so one of my professors at ETH, he also at some point, Martin Quack, he made the statement, we only understand molecules once we predict their properties with quantitative accuracy. So I think the predictive power should be an integral part of how we um, measure our understanding. And so um, there's this famous examples in quantum, uh, example in quantum chemistry when you calculate the energy of the helium atom. Um, and this was done, so it's, it's one of the simplest non uh, systems where, where you don't have an analytical solution. Um, and so uh, the, in the history of quantum chemistry, this is very old, and so in 29, Hilleras um, uh, got this number here. And then in the 50s, uh, you see we have, so the significant digits are in bold. Um, we have more digits. And then in the 60s, we got more, and in the 90s, we got more, and now we have so many digits. And so if I ask you which year did we understand the helium atom, right, um, you, you, you see that there's some arbitrariness in, in this. So, 
So the question is, should be really the, the, there's some context, uh, like, like a hidden variable in here, uh, which is implied that you need a certain accuracy for a certain application, right? So an understanding which might be sufficient for one application might be insufficient for another but you, because you just don't have the accuracy and, and precision for getting there. Now, so it's all, it's very nice if your computer can calculate this, but you would like to understand it too. And, and this is Eugene Wigner. And um, so this, uh, we heard yesterday this, this talk uh, from Professor Pearl, uh, 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 defining understanding. At some point, he said this is illusions of control. Um, so on, on the uh, uh, he also mentioned, as well as Nathan Katz in, in the morning, the, the reduction to low dimensional effective variables. So uh, this uh, this relationship to or, or derived from Occam or the parsimony principle. Um, these these should be. Uh, ingredients for this, right? But I think that there's something missing in all of that, and, and that is really uh, uh, the ability to, to contribute something helpful, right? And so, so helpful for us means helping with an experimental design decision at the end of the day. So our experimental colleagues uh, will actually accept your prediction to alter their, their next design setup. That is uh, something I, I would Consider then uh, to be, yeah, to meet the definition of understanding. Um, so we we try to do that in, in compound space, right? And so this is a huge space, and uh, uh, Sergey just just mentioned it. And uh, here is a visual illustration of this space, just for organic medium-sized chemistry. If 10 to the 60s or so. Uh, possible compounds you could make. And these are the data sets we, we have, humanity has been looking at. And so we have more atoms, um, more possible molecules than atoms in the solar system. So, so this is uh, the, the problem for us. How can we navigate this space? Can we find um, uh, interesting materials uh, in ways other than um, serendipitous ways? So the, the most um, fundamental way to deconstruct these, uh, this space uh, is uh, the, the, the periodic table. Um, we are celebrating 150 years of it this year. Um, and it's, it's still uh, uh, very important. And we, we all grew up with this. But um, you might know that there are alternative ways to arrange your atoms. And this um, is a double helix uh, proposed by Crookes, or this Emerson helix um, uh, with, with, with an increasing radius. Um, these are also valid interpretations, right? And, and maybe even lower dimensional than, than the periodic table as we know it. Um, a famous example, which is actually useful, uh, uh, was proposed by uh, Pettifor in the 80s. And you see this here. Um, it's basically ordering the elements by these lines, which go through your periodic table. And this is the, the 1D uh, projection, which allows you to, for instance, uh, plot enthalpies of formation, which you see here, um, as linear, um, in, in a linear relationship for carbides or nitrides of, of these various elements. right? So it's, it's a projection which, which works for certain compound classes in, in the subspace of chemical space. You, you can exploit this effective uh, low dimensionality. And so that certainly uh, could help you. It, it can, it's quantitative enough to uh, guide your design choices. It's very low dimensional. So I would argue that this effectively um, implies a lot of understanding, at least for the subspace. Now, um, this was in the 80s, but uh, this is still research going on. Just in 2016, Hardy Gross and Miguel Marquez um, uh, modified this Petit Four scale to, to, uh, for, for different applications. So these, these are ongoing um, questions. Now, as you go to, to more complex compounds, not just one dimension, not just one atom, but multiple uh, things uh, become really high dimensional and messy. And so what you see here is for 7,000 molecules, 
you see various electronic structure properties plotted against each other, right? So it's a symmetric matrix, and each box contains 7,000 uh, dots. Each dot is a, is a molecule, right? And so um, that's sort of the data you, you can have, right? That's what we see, and the question is, how do we um, uh, understand this? And so this uh, um, comes from a paper which we published in in 2013, where we um, showed that neural nets, this is actually a neural net study, uh, uh, can be used uh, also to learn across chemical compound space. I believe it was uh, the first. Um, so the, the job then of, of the network or, or our machine learning is really to extract dimensions um, which are hidden. And here you see uh, the homo eigenvalue versus the atomization energy, and you see the scatter plot is, is really messy. Uh, but after learning, we can do a PCA on our network, and you see that now um, we here this axis is the energy, and then you have the PCA 1 and 2, and the color code is now the eigenvalue, and you see a, a nice uh, monotonic uh, smooth surface. So, so this really then explains uh, our observations much better. And so uh, this is what we are going after. We want to find uh, structures in compound space. And here's a, a constellation in compound space. It's, it's a, uh, just an illustration here uh, of uh, the various atoms that arrange to give you aspirin. And each atom can also be viewed um, as, as an atom in, a, in its own chemical environment. Uh, shown by these small molecules. And we want to exploit these relationships which, which exist throughout compound space and that are not being explored enough because uh, conventionally people have exactly the attitude which Sergei phrased that this space is not differentiable, it's all discrete separate instances, uh, but they are actually, they have things in common, the same laws of physics apply in particular. Um, if you have something like this, you can devise a uh, an algorithm to provide you with uh, with interesting materials. And here's an example. Uh, you take randomly some compounds, you, you do uh, the quantum calculations on them, you get the properties of interest, you construct a machine learning algorithm which is applicable throughout chemical space and then you use some optimizer and compound space to find new promising candidates and then you, you repeat and you do this iteratively and you will converge towards materials you, um, you are looking for. Now um, <clears throat> this compound space is, is this uh, well defined or how is it defined really um, so in quantum mechanics uh, this is quite straightforward the first postulate tells you that your system is, is the wave function. And here um, is a single particle uh, Schrödinger equation, the Korn-Sharm equation uh, more specifically. And this is the Hamiltonian. And uh, in this Hamiltonian, you, there are three terms, the external potential, your, your classical Hartree repulsion between the electrons and the exchange correlation potential. And, uh, Nuclear charges and coordinates are explicitly encoded in this external potential. So this is what, from the quantum mechanics point of view, defines your, your system. Um, now you have three spatial degrees of freedom uh, for each atom, and then you have one degree of freedom for your nuclear charge. So dimensionality, the formal dimensionality is 4n, and then you have the number of electrons um, which you distribute over this. So, so this is the formal dimensionality of the unperturbed, um, so without any external effects uh, uh, system and, and chemical space. And so you can uh, think of it as, as the space or spanned by R, Z, and N, and any compound would be a point in, in this space. And um, you can then use uh, the various hierarchies, the various approximations to Schrodinger's equation to uh, compute properties of these compounds, so any point in this space. And uh, this is just a qualitative uh, picture of these uh, typical hierarchies, so force field, semi-empirical methods, Hartree-Fock or mean field methods, perturbation methods, explicitly correlated methods. And typically, as you go down here, your predictive accuracy improves but you have to pay for it in CPU time, right? So it's, it's, uh, this is very expensive. And so um, the, the question is how do you uh, uh, then for a given cost, 
how can we um, improve things. And so it, DFT is also a mean field method, but it gives you much better uh, predictive power than, than Hartree Fock. Or if, if you have a lot of physical insights, you can construct a semi empirical method which is better than Hartree Fock. Um, that's actually possible. And uh, so you, you get more for your buck. And, and this is, of course, worth a lot. And in 98, uh, there was a, no a Nobel Prize for Walter Kohn for DFT and John Popel, who, who developed um, also uh, combination techniques to improve uh, the, the predictive power at constant cost. And um, so this is something extremely valuable. Now, what we think uh, we would need in order to explore this vast compound space are methods that are as transferable as quantum mechanics, but um, that are much faster. And so we'd like to be in this lower left-hand uh, corner here, right? And, and so I will try to tell you um, today uh, where we are in, in uh, trying to get there. Um, so in my lab, we pursued two approaches to do this. Uh, one is based on, on this computational alchemy. So suppose you, you have solved Schrodinger's equation for one point here. Can you tailor expand your way around it um, and also onto other uh, surfaces or compounds? And that's actually possible. You, you can construct these perturbation um, expansion methods. Um, and then the, the machine learning approach is sort of complementary to it. Um, it's akin to saying, well, suppose you solve Schrodinger's equation for every open symbol here. What's the, the statistically rigorous way to inferring uh, the answer of, of the full, uh, the solid uh, symbol here, right? Um, and, and that's, of course, a sort of a Bayesian question, right? Given all this data, what's, what's the property of of the new input. Now, um, when you look at the computational alchemy um, on your computer, of course, you can take N2 and you can change the nuclear charges. And if you do this for both atoms, one increasing, the other one decreasing, then you end up at CO, right? And that's what you see here. And if you go to OC, that must be symmetrical, of course. And so you can see how changing Z, how changing the nuclear charges, affects your electronic energy. And we can calculate these. Um, and so you see a very smooth surface. And it, it's very reasonable to expect that we can uh, tailor expand this, that we can regress uh, such a surface. Um, obviously, um, only for integer Zs you will have experimental correspondences, but that doesn't mean that fractional Zs are useless. Um, <clears throat> so one way to exploit this is to go to second order derivatives. These would define a Hessian in your chemical space here. This is shown for diatomic, so the Hessian of N2 is given here at the Hartree Fock level, and we can diagonalize the session, and you will find that there are two um, eigenstates in the part of the, where we change the nuclear charges. They are shown here. One is going up and down, and the other one is increasing or decreasing both nuclear charges, and they span the entire chemical space of all diatomics with 14 protons and 14 electrons. Sorry, 14 electrons as you go up and down here, you change the number of protons. Um, now, this can be, this is a very general Hessian, and um, in this work just published this year, we uh, looked at, at uh, these, these uh, normal modes, as we call them, and I'm just showing you uh, this example from this part of work. It has nothing to do with machine learning, but just to show you where we are coming from in terms of wanting uh, to understand something about compound space, right? And so uh, here you see now these eigenstates, these alchemical eigenstates from the Hessian of benzene, the benzene molecule. They look like this. And you can now expand any molecule, which you see here in the top row, containing um, boron and nitrogen atoms. You can expand any of these molecules in a linear combination of these normal modes. So they form a, a complete um, uh, basis in, uh, for expanding chemical space. And it's very intuitive what each of these normal modes mean. Um, and here in this uh, plot, you see the predicted versus the actual energy. And so, so there's also predictive power in this. 
Um, here I show that uh, the same normal modes also work for solids um, and also going up and down the periodic table. Uh, so this is really the quantum nature of the whole approach. We want to be general throughout compound space. There's no restriction. This only works for, for molecules, small or large uh, solids, uh, liquids, whatever. It's, it's uh, very as general as, as the quantum approach. If you're interested in this, uh, the software we are developing in the group on this is on, on GitHub. Uh, we call it Alchemical Perturbation DFT, and uh, you can have a look here. So coming now to um, the machine learning uh, approach, what we really wish to do then is to replace the map from nuclear charges and coordinates and electrons to some observers such as the energy. Uh, this map, which traditionally we, we um, perform by numerically solving uh, the, the second order differential equation uh, that's in here, we want, given many examples of input output here, we want to uh, construct a statistical map which for a new input would uh, give us the estimate of the output. And we call this quantum machine learning because um, uh, in, in quantum chemistry, we, uh, we like to put quantum in front of mechanics or, or classical algorithms when it comes to the prediction of quantum properties. So um, examples are for this quantum Monte Carlo, where we use classical Monte Carlo steps in, in your uh, wave function coefficient space, or uh, quantum molecular dynamics, where we, uh, where we run uh, Newton uh, dynamics, uh, Newtonian dynamics, um, uh, to obtain quantum uh, properties. Um, so uh, we really uh, want to solve quantum properties, uh, solve for quantum properties now using classical machine learning algorithms. So this has nothing to do with quantum computing. Um, now, um, <coughs> Sergey um, uh, likes to stress that solving um, uh, the quantum problems with machine learning is easy because we theorists know everything. Uh, what he is really referring to is um, that we know our input, right? We know what, what we are studying. And um, this is, um, of course, true. And I think this is also part of, of the whole quantum thing in, in many chem informatics or bioinformatics approaches or problems um, uh, where machine learning is used. Um, uh, this is also not a given. And so uh, for all these reasons, we like to distinguish ourselves by uh, using this acronym. So we do really have a causal relationship. Um, it's very clear what we have to learn. The job is well defined. Um, and uh, this is also something that it, we did not invent. We are not the first people using machine learning and atomistic simulation. Uh, there are papers going back as far as the 90s where, um, for instance, Bobby Sumter and, and Bill Noyd used neural networks to uh, study forces on, on atoms and fitting potential energy surfaces. Um, and so this has a long tradition, and all these uh, scientists are uh, uh, important players in the field. Now, uh, our interests and approaches differ in the sense from these approaches that we are really trying to go through compound space. So all these uh, approaches really um, are, are restricted to the application that you train on a given system in order to uh, predict forces and sample its phase space, while uh, we are really trying to go throughout compound space, not, not just the configuration and spaces of the atoms. So. Um, in 2011, um, I organized an IPAM program on navigating chemical compound space. And at that program, Klaus Müller, who is the, the chair uh, of machine learning at TU Berlin, Alex Tkachenko, a long-term collaborator of mine, whom I also met at IPAM six, six years prior to that, um, and Matthias Rapp, who at the time was a postdoc with Klaus, they all participated in this program and, and we got together and tried to address this question, how can we exploit these correlations throughout chemical compound space such that we can make uh, predictions for new compounds. And 
Um, so what Klaus basically told us is that we should um, use this kernel rich regression approach where we say we expand our property of some material or molecule in the, as a sum over uh, training instances i. We measure the similarity to training instance i with some kernel function and we get a regression coefficient for each instance by inverting the kernel matrix between our training instances. And, um, that was very straightforward and appealing to us. And uh, so the big question then was only, uh, well, what, what is, how do we represent M, right, uh, the, the material? And um, so uh, we, we talked a lot about this and um, what, what our machine learning experts, uh, Matthias and Klaus, of course, insisted on was that it should be physical and uh, meaningful and uh, it should account for all the degrees of freedom, of course, you need all the degrees of freedom that enter uh, the Schrodinger equation. And when looking really hard at, at the external potential and the Hamiltonian, um, the, the sort of uh, best thing uh, I could actually then uh, eventually then propose to Matthias was uh, this what we now is known, the, the Coulomb matrix. Um, so the genesis of this was simply to say, well, uh, let's start with some atom in your molecule and if, if, if it's there, it should be interacting. So let's record the interactions. And so this atom should interact with this one, this one, this one, and so on. And so you, you put them all in a row and um, the simplest model of the interactions is, of course, the nuclear uh, Coulomb repulsion, right? That's uh, among the easiest you can think of. And uh, then you do the same thing for the next atom, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And before you know it, you have a symmetric matrix, which uh, basically encodes the complete graph of, of your system. Um, and so this is, uh, on the diagonal, we, we put um, an estimate of the energy of the free atom. And so this represents your system in the sense that there are no two, no two molecules that are different that would give you the same Coulomb matrix, right? And uh, so Matthias tried this, and, and he tried many variants of this, and it took some time. But eventually, we, we arrived at this uh, learning curve where your prediction error uh, decays systematically with the uh, training set size. And uh, this was a prediction error on the atomization energy. So the quantum energy that stores all the energy content of your chemical bonds. So it's very uh, central uh, quantum property. And uh, so to the best of my knowledge, this was the first time this was really d uh, demonstrated numerically that this is possible throughout compound space. Um, <clears throat> now, these learning curves um, are very important for us. And uh, Vapnik and others showed in the 90s that uh, the, uh, the prediction error really must decay uh, down to arbitrary uh, uh, size um, for uh, in the limit of infinite training set sizes. And uh, the leading error term was identified to just decay inversely with training set size. And so in, in the 90s, uh, Cortes et al. Uh, uh, suggested already we should be plotting these errors on a log-log scale uh, to linearize things. Um, and uh, Klaus Müller also in the 90s actually, he also showed that the same holds for neural nets. So there's uh, no excuse in, in not plotting these. Um, so I find it very, uh, at the time I found this really amazing, um, but it's, it's actually quite easy to understand why uh, this behavior um, must, must be the case. Um, so if, if you uh, look at a traditional fit which compri compromises between some um, noisy data here uh, with a rigid uh, functional form, um, then uh, you, you, in your regression you, you minimize the overall deviation from that. Um, we all know that, but what we are really doing within the kernel rich regression approach is to rather interpolate every data point. And, and so this is an important distinction in, in our field that our data is not so noisy. Um, uh, typically our numerical noise in, in our calculations should be uh, many orders of magnitude smaller than, than uh, the signal we, we, we are interested in. And so um, this, this idea that given some data here, you, you find through kernel-rich regression the most probable 
uh, interpolating model here um, was really appealing to us, but it should really go through every training data point, so your training error should be very small, right? Uh, negligibly small. Um, and so as you add, as you increase then the density of your data here by increasing the training set size for, for a fixed range, your error must come down, right? There's no way around it. And um, so this is basically what, what these, uh, this proof implies. And um, if you plot the test and training error learning curves, um, then as opposed to the traditional red functional form, what we get is the blue, and, and this must just come down. All right, so we have something which decreases your error, and now um, on this axis we had computational cost, and this is our training set size, and that costs. Right, so we have cost versus error. This still holds, but now we can train a model, and once we trained it, of course, the execution of this model is really fast. So shifting this computational load from the heavy on-the-fly calculation towards, uh, uh, some people call it sequential learning, right? Uh, towards learning something first and then making a rapid prediction, this is really a, a paradigm shift for us. Now, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'd like to tell you how we can um, work on these learning curves, uh, which should be linear. So if it looks like something like this, something is wrong. Um, how we can work on them such that we can lower offset or even uh, improve on the slope. Um, and I'd like to come back to the Coulomb matrix for this. Um, uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, we published in 2014 a data set called uh, QM9, and uh, Matthias Rubb uh, had joined the lab and uh, is a co-author of this. And this idea was actually during coffee break, we, we, uh, uh, this came up as a suggestion, this is something we should do. And actually, I was against it. I, I thought, this is silly. Um, uh, we, we don't need uh, 10,000 quantum calculations or 100 thousand anybody could do this but at the end uh, I, I was convinced and and uh, we went ahead and it, it became very useful for benchmarking methods and so um, just a couple of years later uh, after the Coulomb matrix we um, published a, a revised version of it called bag of bonds where we basically have the elements of the Coulomb matrix arranged in, in uh, as a bag uh, in the bag format and uh, so this loses the connectivity information, but it improves uh, the similarity between the elements that uh, get compared to each other in the kernel. And so overall, you, you see a reduction in, in uh, offset of these learning curves. And uh, so when you ask, uh, when, when we were discussing how to improve things um, in, in the representation, the, the standard argument was that we should be including more, more physics. And so this is not always obvious how, how you would include more physics, but um, what's typically easier is uh, to, to how to remove physics, right? And so uh, this is something we, we did here. Um, so if you, if you think of the one over R behavior and your Coulomb potential as, as this blue line, then by changing the exponent n here, you can also obtain a, a linearly increasing or quadratically increasing function, of course. And um, so uh, the, the reason why we have the 1 over r is, of course, that this is very physical, that as atoms go apart, the, the, their interaction should decrease. Now, if you make this linearly increasing, you, what you're implying is that the interaction increases with the distance, which is uh, obviously less physical. And, and so you should observe then a, a learning curve which is less favorable, right? And so sure enough, if, if this, is, this was the Coulomb matrix learning curve, and if you go to uh, the linearly increasing, your learning curve goes up. And if you make it quadratic, things get worse. And so uh, this learning curve clearly reflects the degree of our understanding that, that is encoded in the model. If we go the other way around, the learning curves uh, converge around 10 to the minus uh, 6, and uh, every uh, physical uh, chemist will, will immediately recognize this as the dissociative tail in the Leonard Jones potential, right? So um, this might uh, not be coincidence. 
Um, so based on this, we thought, well, then uh, the, the most physical thing we have is a force field. So we used the universal force field of Goddard et al. from the 90s. And we included then uh, the dressed atoms, the bonds, typically Morse potentials, um, angles, and uh, torsional degrees of freedom. And as you include more and more of these degrees of freedoms, you, you go from bonds here to angles to torsion. You see how the learning curve systematically comes down. Um, this works also for other properties. These are now nine properties from the QM9 data set for molecules with this stoichiometry. These are constitutional isomers. We have uh, 6,000 of them. And even for the worst outliers, you see how adding these, uh, the, these, this additional physics encoded in bonds and angles and torsion, it decreases the error. And, um, and finally, we also ran this over the entire 134,000 molecules with varying stoichiometries. And we found the same trend for each and every property. Uh, you get a systematic improvement as you include these higher order terms. Um, so this model is, is the, the green model. And all we did, uh, all we changed here is the representation, right? It's the same data. It's the same, uh, the same kernel functions, the same setup. Um, in 2016, we then started to collaborate with, with uh, Patrick Riley, um, who is also present in, in uh, this workshop. And uh, we, we, with his team, we worked on using also neural nets. And you see this in the regressors, uh, GG and GC are neural nets. Um, and we tried various representations. Um, the ECFP4, which is quite common, and during this uh, fall semester it was mentioned multiple times. It's a common descriptor in chem informatics. We also included this one. And uh, you will notice that for ver several properties, uh, there's not even a line for ECFP4. And the reason for that is it's so bad, it's off the chart in comparison to other models. Um, What's new here in terms of representations are these HDAD uh, representations. And actually, this HDAD in green here for the energy box gives you the, the lowest uh, learning curve. And this was a new representation um, which was uh, proposed in, in this paper. And actually, Luke Hutchinson, the, the second author, he proposed this, um, and it's it's really it's shown here again. It reaches um, the accuracy of DFT very rapidly, and then it even reaches chemical accuracy um, at 30,000 uh, molecules or so. Um, and this representation looks like this. H dead stands for histogram of distances, angles, and dihedrals, and it's really ugly, right? So this is just some um, uh, uh, examples for a selection of pairs, triplets, and quadruplets. Um, and uh, you see in that data set, that's how it looks like. Um, yet it's, it's uh, at the time, it was the best representation. Um, so on, on this overview, it, it corresponds to this red line. Um, now, based on this, this idea that there should be something like a force field and there should be some histogram, um, we, we thought, OK, let's try to combine this. So there was a question. Yeah, the so what's the difference compared to Ben Palinello or Annie and, uh, and those histograms? But they also have so I, I'll show some of their results in a minute. Yeah. No, That's maybe. It's very sim similar. They also have uh, uh, radial distribution-based uh, um, uh, representations. So in, in our latest representation, we try to marry these two. We try to marry the force fields idea together uh, with, the, with the distribution ideas. And uh, this is what we call now the FCHL representation after um, the names of the authors of that paper. Um, uh, the idea is that we place Gaussians for one body, two body, three body, and so on, up to m bodies. And the one body Gaussian is basically Gaussian in the periodic table. So the period and the group of the periodic table get, get a little uh, Gaussian well. And um, uh, like this, different elements can overlap and uh, can share their, their chemistry. And then uh, the two body term contains this 
function chi here, which is basically a power law, and um, it's, it's, uh, we, we find that r to the minus 4 for this is, is for the two body term is the best. Um, and we, you can do this uh, because it's Gaussians, you can do this analytically, and here you see all the distances for 1, 2, and 3 bodies. Um, if you use this representation, you get as a learning curve this black uh, curve here. And now you see included also soap uh, in orange. Um, and uh, here's also a neural net from, this is a deep tensor neural net from Klaus Müller's group. And this was a, a message passing neural net from, from Google. Um, the most recent contributions in the field are listed here. Um, you see here the, the hip neural net uh, from Los Alamos, which is um, 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 the, the most sophisticated variant of the ANI neural net, which employs the Bela Bainello um, representations. Um, <clears throat> you see also from Stefan Maillard, uh, group from Ecole Normale, uh, they also have a, a machine learning model which has a point here. Uh, there's some active learning models from Skoltech in, in red with the stars shown here. Um, so we really, this, this was the situation actually last summer, and since then we, we wanted to push the field and motivate the field a little bit more. And um, uh, so we, we announced the QM9 IPAM challenge from, from 2018. So every prof on this list here promised 100 bucks. Um, to uh, the authors or to the developers of a machine learning model which would have a learning curve that would go through here. So basically chemical accuracy at 100 uh, training instances. Uh, we think this is a, a very, this would be so low dimensional that we could really um, analyze it in a human understanding sort of way and um, this should be very informative. But it, it seems to be very hard. So all these models uh, seem to, to converge towards um, some, some bound here. Um, we don't know if, if there's a reason for that. Now, this FCHL representation, it's, it's of course inspired by quantum mechanics, so it's applicable throughout compound space. And here you see it working for uh, amino acid side chains. It it's, uh, gave one of the best performances. You see it working here for water clusters, um, giving the, the best performance for solids from the alpasolite kind or from the open quantum materials database, this very heterogeneous crystals. And uh, here we learn the formation energy and we actually, the FCHL outperforms this, this tessellation uh, machine learning model by, by Chris Wolverton. And here there's also a Schnett point um, from from Klaus Müller's group. So why does FCHL work so well? Um, so we, we, I sort of described you how we arrived at it, but of course it's interesting to analyze it afterwards. If you do a PCA on the kernel of a Coulomb matrix, um, you will find something like this for the atomization energy as a color code. So it's really messy. It looks like a projection from some higher dimensional space just onto two. If you do the same for FCHL, things are actually much smoother. Um, and uh, this is, can easily be understand, uh, understood. You, you basically increase the size of the compounds as you go from left to right. And within every, any uh, of, of these clusters here, you have just varying stoichiometries by, by where you have the same number of atoms, but you, you change just one atom in its nuclear charge. Now here is a comparison of the FCHL and, uh, with respect to radial and angular distribution functions. What um, you're seeing here is the similarity, so the distance in compound space between water and its equilibrium and distortions in the length of the bond between oxygen and hydrogen, that's this axis, and distortions in the angle, that's this axis. And you see for FCHL, uh, we call it here A3 because we go up to third body, um, you see a, a very nice uh, minimum. Um, and if you go just for angular distribution function, um, then of course it, it doesn't, it's invariant with respect to length. Uh, if you uh, look at the radial distribution function, it's invariant 
um, uh, with respect to angle. So it's it's this. It looks like this, right? So this is how it looks like for for oxygen and for hydrogen. They look like this. So you see some uh, uh, very strong difference, and uh, you can also machine learn. Then the difference in the energy and the color code is uh, your your energy error, which you make when you machine learn this, and just using this. Um, uh, with a very small kernel on the difference here, you, you basically have a very, very small error. Using radial distribution functions um, alone, you get a huge error. Uh, angular alone, a huge error. If you combine them, things uh, average more out, but, but it's still substantial. Now I'd like to um, look now um, and, and switch gears a little bit and, and look at a different property. In particular, if you go back to this paper with the Google guys, um, we, we got this result here from the, for the learning the dipole moment. And this is a very tricky property for most models, except for a neural net here, which actually does quite well. But uh, please remember, so it reaches chemical accuracy at 100,000 molecules, which is uh, a lot of molecules, really. So um, we were wondering why, why is it that these kernel methods perform so well for some properties and for others um, hardly at all. And um, so you, you can think of the dipole moment as a property which is actually related to the energy and uh, it's very straightforwardly so it's the derivative of the energy with respect to an electric field. And so we could um, apply such derivatives to our kernel model of the energy. Right? So if this is our model, we now have some uh, response operator working on our energy and uh, that should give us the response property. And so this operator should then work on our kernel model. And if you go through this, um, then the, your loss function uh, has to be affected. And this is shown here. And uh, when you solve for your alpha coefficients, uh, you see how the response operator uh, propagates throughout uh, your expressions here. And here you see the, explicitly the terms um, for first order derivatives of a field, for instance, or a force of an atom. So. Uh, with, with three uh, dimensions um, for, for the left-hand bracket and the right-hand bracket in uh, the expression for uh, where you have to solve for your regression coefficients. But of course, you can also do this for second-order derivatives. So these are the corresponding expressions for second-order derivatives. And um, so it's easy to go up to any order in your, in your differentiation here. Um, so what happens if you use this for your dipole moment, here you see a toy example, this hydrogen fluoride in fields and the orientation of the field is shown here by the arrow. Um, so the energy as a function of the field changes and you see in red here the MP2 results for this. Now if you don't use these derivatives, you don't have this dependency, it's always the same geometry, right? So obviously there should, the, the machine should not know about it. And so this is what you see in dotted here. This is the dotted line. You, you just have this one data point. Um, if you then include the derivatives, you get the dashed line, and uh, uh, it, it works quite well. Now, of course, you need, um, if you derive with respect to the field, you, you need the field to be represented in, in your model. And so we extended the, our representation by an electric field model, which is uh, qualitative. So it's a very qualitative and inaccurate model, very cheap to obtain, just using atomic charges from, from the literature. And it hardly matters. But you need it so that the, the important terms in your uh, derivative don't vanish. Um, and so when you apply this to QM9, you can then uh, reduce, improve the learning curve uh, of FCHL for the dipole moment. You, you can uh, improve it. It needs 20 times less data to get the same level of accuracy. So we, we exploited the, the, the relationship between these properties, our understanding of these properties in the model by uh, simply including it in the, in the loss function. Now also forces are derivatives, and so we can play the same game with forces. Here you see uh, the toy model of HF again, this time a binding curve. With and without the derivatives, your um, machine learning model improves a lot or, or is uh, quite poor. 
respectively. So these are now um, results for data sets and uh, we get uh, good learning of energies and forces with this. And um, uh, Gabot Sani and others, Michele Ciaiotti, they are working with soap a lot to, to get potentials and they get similar um, they also get forces and so the question is a little bit how, how does this differ and it's actually quite straightforward what we have in our kernel is a, a block for the derivatives of the kernel and the normal kernel for energy and forces right and so this is what uh, comes out when you differentiate through uh, your model um, in the SOAP um, uh, approach, what is formally being used is, is a much larger kernel. In particular, it contains this covariance block here. And this is derived from Gaussian process regression. This is what you get out of that. And so that's basically the main difference. Um, the GDML model by uh, Stefan Schmieler and, and others from, from Klaus Müller's group uh, basically focuses only on this, on this block. Right, and uh, so you learn on this block. So the, these are the differences between the various models. Um, so here you see some um, learning curves for the MD17 data set. You have uh, GDML in green and uh, in, in blue uh, our operator machines, and in red the Schnett, and you see overall for energies and and forces on average uh, the, the operator approach is, is as le at least as good as GDML. Now note that it's, it's also much uh, more efficient because you don't need these, this covariance kernel. Um, in the most recent paper we accelerated FCHL even more using basically a Fourier transform and a Fourier series expansion on the three body terms. I, I don't go into details here, but now it's much faster and we can therefore optimize hyperparameters better and this results in, in better performance. And what you see here now in purple are this FCHL19 operator. These are the fastest predictions. We can also do what SOAP does, use the Gaussian process regression with the full, the, the covariance kernel, and then you, you get better performance, but you have to pay for it with, with more uh, expensive models. Now the training times are very important. It's often criticized that kernel methods are slow. I uh, disagree on this. If, if the, the representation is accurate, you don't need much training data and therefore the, the training can be, still be very fast. What you see here are training times in CPU uh, uh, seconds. And uh, you see here the number of atoms in your molecule, and you see we, we are in, in, uh, uh, on the range of minutes, less than an hour for, for training these. How much time do I have? Nothing. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. Minus two. Minus two? All right. I'll, I'll stop here. Um, <laughs> I could tell you about more such things, but we ran out of time. Thank you for your attention.